Call this meeting to order. I'm going to call this or, uh, meeting to order. It is March 7th, 2024. This is our regularly scheduled City of Glenwood Springs City Council meeting. Thanks everyone for coming this evening. We are going to go ahead and start the meeting um, with a roll call. Mayor Wuso. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Dane. Here. Councilor Godis. Here. Councilor Weimer. Here. Councilor Kalp. We have a quorum. Excellent. Thank you, Ryan. Um, the next item is agenda changes or conflicts. Do we have any this evening? Councillor Godis. Um, could we pull item J, the polling service related to street and infrastructure tax off and insert that as uh, the new number nine or wherever we want to insert it? Um, I will change it to it can be number anywhere. 12, which is the last item before council comments. Item 12. Okay. Um, moving on to council announcements. Do I have any? No. Okay. Um, we'll then move on to citizens appearing before council. As a reminder, these are for items not on the agenda. So if you are here to talk about, well, there's not a whole lot, but Southbridge, Roaring Fork Outdoor Volunteers, or Mind Springs, please hold tight and instead um, talk at that time. And for right now, we will start with Mr. Scott Dillard. If you'll come up, Scott, just state your name and if you live in city limits. Thanks. My name is Scott Dillard. I live in Carbondale. Can I still speak? You can. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I appreciate giving me a few minutes. I also appreciate your guys' time. Um, you guys have a thankless job sometimes, and it's very difficult, so I definitely appreciate it. Can I hand you something real quick? Sure. You can hand it to our city clerk or our uh, city manager, and he will pass it down. So I represent a lot owner on Cowden Drive. It's out at the confluence at the end of Cowden. Um, it's a high-density multifamily lot. And I just kind of wanted to come and plant the seed to this of the, with you guys that it would be a great parcel for the city to own. Um, it's high density. Uh, it, it's zoned for 14 units, has all the utilities there for 14 units. As you can see, the plans we have there, it has ample parking. Um, 14 is definitely very tight, but it is doable. Um, we just feel like the city could get a lot from this by, by giving work, workforce housing, but also it's an opportunity to do a little um, like a pocket park mm -hmm. in the corner to give the neighborhood river access, which they don't have right now because it's a private parcel. Thank you. Um, I also think it's a great opportunity to use the 2C funding. Um, we've done extensive due diligence. So, I mean, a developer or yourselves, you know, it, the, the table is set 
so you know exactly what it is um, from from traffic studies to surveys to civil to stormwater retention it's all ready to go mm -hmm. um, and that's all I really had to say. Just wanted to plant that seed. Uh, if you guys ever want to talk more about it or you know meet on site, um, I'd be happy to talk more about it. Thank you. Um, normally, I don't make a lot of comments, but I will say that our 2C commission is also forming up. And if you wanted to contact them and also present this idea, that's an option as well. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Um, moving on to Jessica Richardson. I know I'm to talk. Okay. Hannah Sago? Did I say that right? Saga. Saga, thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Hannah Sago. I live in Glenwood Springs. I'll keep this short. I just want to thank you for having passed the resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza and the occupied West Bank. Um, a majority of Americans do support a permanent ceasefire, and I have personally talked to and met many people in this community who also do. I know you've experienced a lot of both support and backlash, and I just want to share that even Martin Luther King Jr. received enormous backlash and criticism when he came out against the Vietnam War. We need more local leadership who have the moral clarity and courage that you all do. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. <clears throat> Amy Hausman. Um, same thing, pretty much what Hannah just said, too, that I would really, I wanted to thank you all for supporting the ceasefire in Gaza. I think it was an important move. I think it was a brave move. And I know, as she said, you've gotten some backlash. So just to say thank you. Thank you for coming this evening. We appreciate it. West Glen. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, Maya Hunt. Okay, thank you. Um, and with that, I will just see, Is does anybody else in the crowd here in person want to speak this evening? Come on up. Yeah, absolutely. Your name, the My town. My name is Andy Anderson. I live on Blake Avenue. Hey, Andy. Uh, I'd like to bring to your attention a problem with your garbage program. Okay. There's quite a few people in the downtown area are having other people put their trash in mm -hmm. the cans. The lids don't close. They've been fined. Now, the fine's been waived this time, but they were also told only once per resident. Now, I think this is a problem the city created because there never used to be a fine for your lids not closing. These people have contacted the police department and gotten nothing. I'm a big supporter of the police. I love our police department. It's awesome. 31 we years here, I had one bicycle stolen. Okay. You can't do better than that. But I think the city needs to get code enforcement involved and enforce the laws. If you're going to find people for this, mm -hmm. then you need to give them a recourse. Then I've heard stupid things, well, put a lock on your can. Mm -hmm. I can see mount mountain waste running around with 800 keys mm -hmm. for locks. Not going to work. Yeah. So address the problem. Okay. These people are wondering, they're afraid to not pay the fine now because their water will get shut off. And that is a contradiction and that shouldn't happen. So direct the police department to, to look into this. Okay. They can go through the trash and find somebody's mail. They can find out who's doing this. And yeah. it's the people whose cans that are, can't stay home from work and guard them and try to photograph the person. Yeah. It's a police department issue. Thank you. That's all I got, yeah. thanks. So at the closing of public comment, I'm just gonna express gratitude for everyone who does come this evening. Um, this is the forum to make sure that all of your city council hears your words. Um, it's not social media. Um, it's not to your neighbors, but this is it. So I really appreciate you coming. Um, your words have power. We have heard them uh, for the last, um, I think it was Andy Anderson. Um, you can contact Steve Boyd, our city manager, and he'll probably connect you maybe with Matt Langhorse and or um, who is it? someone and, and, and we'll help see if there's a, a plausible solution. So thank you. Um, closing public comment and moving on um, to back to council for a motion to approve the consent agenda. I feel moved. Can you please turn on your mic? Thank you. Councilor Kelly. I move to approve the consent agenda minus item J. Thank you. I'll second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. We will move on to our first item under actions or presentations. That is item number nine, update from Mind Springs on the progress of Detox Center. Um, 
I don't know. Thank you, Hans. Okay. Uh, good evening, Council. Thanks for having me. Um, and we can make this relatively quick, I think. Steve's been uh, at our governance meetings and I think hopefully keeping everybody abreast um, of the situation. We are um, certainly appreciative of City Council and City of Glenwood Springs for being good partners with us. We are literally um, at the finish line um, for a really, really, really um, multiple, multi-year long process um, of getting us to a place where we're getting ready to um, officially have that, um, one of those missing components um, on the recovery continuum, uh, which is formerly known as detox, but um, uh, what we call withdrawal management facility. Um, the, the updates, I think, that are important to share are, um, we're about, I think we're about a month behind where we thought maybe we would be um just from you know the realities of subcontractor schedules and and things getting getting in line um and just kind of the bandwidth of um, construction processes um so i think realistically we're targeting construction completion being done at the end of april and looking at likely opening the doors of withdrawal management front end of May. Um, so we're, we're literally at the doorstep. Um, you know, we've had some significant increase in costs, um, which council's aware of, um, but we are, we are about, secured about 1.6 million um, of the funding that we needed for the capital build, which leaves us about $200,000 um, short um, and we are continuing to work with our grant writer to try to secure some funds um, to get us to the finish line. If we don't have any uh, additional funds, we are going to be covering the cost to get us to the finish line. Um, the, the other, I think, update for council is, I think, I think you guys are already aware of this, but, you know, we've shifted, um, the programmatic, um, framework for the withdrawal management to be a medically supported uh, 3.7 level of care. And that's just an ASAM level of care, uh, which basically means that um, we will be able to do our own medical clearances, which is a significant benefit to the community, specifically both hospitals, emergency departments, so that they don't have to be stressed in doing those medical clearances, which also makes life a lot easier on law enforcement partners and our uh, paramedics who can do drop direct drops at withdrawal management, which is a significant change from the social setting withdrawal management that we originally had um, kind of conceptualized on the front end of this. So, um, and that certainly contributed some to some of the additional costs. Um, so, long story short, <clears throat> sort of, um, we're at the finish line. We. Um, are hiring and recruiting now uh, for the positions um, to to staff our facility, and we don't anticipate any more um, scheduling issues um, or supply chain issues, any getting things up and off the ground front end of May. So, just want to say thank you to uh, Council for for continuing to be at the table and helping us get to the finish line. Um, it's going to be a really, really, really necessary stop on the recovery continuum. And I, I, I'm very intentional about the stop piece. It's not the fix all, cure all, uh, for people struggling with substance use, but it is a necessary stop that we don't have locally um, that I think will be really, really impactful for people who are struggling with substance use services. So, questions <laughs> for me. Any questions? Councilor Kuhn. Um, Hans, what's in place for the like follow up? What what happens after detox talks when they sure. leave the facility? Yeah, and that's the other point of of me being intentional about it being a stop. Um, mm -hmm. Since we kind of started this discussion, um, I think close to four years ago, um, we understood that this was going to be a place where people could safely sober up, basically. And so what we've always had as part of our planning was a 
mobile recovery team component of the detox planning. Uh, we've already tested this um, previously uh, with um, a program that was, you know, uh, I think it's now two years it's been gone, but um, having case managers and people with lived experience, uh, peer specialists that help transition people successfully back to the community by connecting them to resources uh, around recovery um, and, and, and other community resources potentially going to be needing. So that is part of our pro forma and part of our budget and part of our planning process is that we will have those people when people have successfully completed the withdrawal, um, having them get them back to the community uh, that they came from successfully. And that certainly is going to include transportation, uh, but also connecting them to resources on that recovery continuum outside of, of the actual so there will be a follow-up process, basically. Yeah, I mean, there's always been case management case around case. detox, but this is going right. to be a very mobile-facing unit okay. um, that's going to help shepherd people back to those resources that they need to be successful to hopefully prevent that revolving door. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I think that's it. Just huge gratitude. I think we're... I think a lot of the community resources that go to serve this community um, will hopefully breathe a sigh of relief when you guys open. And I, I look forward to the collaboration that occurs in supporting this group. So thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for coming tonight. Okay. Appreciate it. Um, moving on. To update from Roaring Fork Outdoor Volunteers, RFOV. Hi, nice to see you. <laughs> I do have a presentation, but um, should I use my computer or do you, do you want to queue it up on yours? And I know that you all probably don't want more paper, but mm -hmm. oh, I have a. Oh. Technology. <laughs> Do you have HDMI? <laughs> I can also do it without a without a presentation. You're welcome to pass out the paper versions if you'd like. This is just our impact report from last year. I don't know. So just like the treat Let's do the next year one. Thank you. You got it. <clears throat> she can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that it's messy. I like it. So while we're getting that set up, um, I'm Becca Schild. I'm the executive director of Rowing Park Outdoor Volunteers. And thank you so much for the invitation to come present to you all. I don't think I've had the pleasure of presenting to city council. Um, I've been at RFOV for four and a half years, and we are so grateful for the support that the city provides to us both financially and through the partnerships and collaboration with the Parks and Recreation Department and other um, departments within the city. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit more. So how many of you know about Roaring Park Outdoor Volunteers? A little bit. We have grown quite a bit in the past four years. We're now based in Carbon Carbondale. We're um, going to be celebrating our 30th anniversary next year. And our main um, reason for being is to connect community members to their public lands through stewardship programs and projects and um, to help conserve and protect the amazing public lands in our region that make this such a wonderful place to live and um, where we have healthy and vibrant communities. 
So I'm just giving a little, I, I don't, do you have it? Uh, no, then I'm just gonna go for it. Um, <laughs> yeah, just, I don't have it yet. And I'll just follow my, I'll follow along with myself. So um, we have, we're, we've always been known for doing trail work, um, but in the last several years, we've really focused on developing skills and capacity around ecological restoration work, as well as fire mitigation work. So that includes both fire prevention or fire mitigation and um, post-fire recovery. Um, and so we have built out our stewardship program areas so that we're able to offer services to land managers in those three realms, as well as appeal to a very diverse group of our community members in terms of the types of volunteer projects that they would like to participate in. We also have a very um, robust youth program, suite of youth programs that we call the Young Stewards Program. And um, our mission there is to inspire the next generation of land stewards. So each year we educate almost a thousand youth from Newcat or from um, Rifle up to Aspen through a variety of programs. The most recent and impactful program that we've launched is the Youth and Nature High School Internship. And it takes students from all area high schools, Aspen to, um, we try to get students from Parachute and they come together, which is quite unique in this area for a paid um, internship opportunity where they have the opportunity to be exposed to um, careers in the outdoors, careers in the environmental field, as well as team building, leadership building and community engagement. And they meet once a month um, for the course of the academic year. We also do youth service learning projects with schools um, from kindergarten, actually my daughter's preschool is probably going to do a program all the way to high school age students and other youth serving organizations. So we partner with the Buddy Program to provide service learning pro projects for their students, um, Stepping Stones, um, the Yampa Mountain High School, uh, we, we were able to customize the service project for their needs and potentially for what they're learning in their curriculum. So that's a little bit about us. In 2023, we engaged over 1,400 unique volunteers, which is the most you know engagement we've had in our in our history. And those volunteers contributed 7,570 7,557 hours dedicated to stewardship of our regional public lands. And then something that may not be aware, um, publicly known is that we've really grown as a staff. So we also have a professional trail crew. So combined with our volunteers, we contributed 12,500 hours of stewardship. And so that's the equivalent of almost two years of somebody working full time. And we were able to do that through the efforts of all of our community members. Um, specifically to Glenwood Springs, that equates to $85,000 of stewardship value. Um, and so again, we're grateful to, um, through the financial advisory board grant and the line item budget that you all have allocated to us. We have worked this past year on the Storm King Trail. We've continued our work in Wolfson Mountain Park to help mitigate the fire threat that exists in that wildland urban interface. And we also worked on a Riverside Open, open Space project that is um, trying to create more river access in a newly, I don't know if it was a newly acquired or um, just newly opened um, riverfront property that the city owns. We also have adopted trail groups. Um, so REI has adopted the cross trail and they commit several days over the season um, to work on that. And then we have youth groups who have gone up to uh, this last year Doc Holiday Trail and um, the, the uh, Boy Scout Trail as well. And then our trail crew spent two weeks doing work for the Parks and Recreation Department on um, the Cross Trail and East Conservancy Park Trail. And I've got some great before and after photos, and so I'll send this to you all after the presentation. Mm -hmm. This coming year, we are um, planning more of what we're, you know, what we're known for, what we're doing. We've gotten a second, we're the first organization to receive a second round of stewardship impact um, funding through Great Outdoors Colorado. So we're continuing to provide the same level of services that we have been over the last two years. And we're really focusing on our engagement and outreach of historically underrepresented communities and populations in our region and are currently working with a consulting company to help guide us down that path. We have a lot of exciting projects coming up for all of you. So March 18th, 
um, projects open, uh, registration opens for members and April 3rd registration opens for the public. Some highlights for you to put on your radar is Latino Conservation Week. We're partnering with Wilderness Workshop and we'll be doing a project um, here in Glenwood at, Rivers, at um, a Riverside open space, kind of to TBD what that looks like. We hope to work at Hanging Lake and have a community volunteer project. Oh, there we go. Oh, just got it. Why don't you just skip all the way down to the map section? Yeah. We don't see. There's that. some beautiful yeah. pictures. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh there we go. <laughs> Hold on one second. This. So there's our before and after from our volunteer project. And our before and after with our trail crew. And the trail crew is really a workforce development project. We bring in um, very young people generally with not a lot of experience, but we're able to train them and introduce them to a lot of different um, professional projects in this field. And we actually, one of our former, former seasonal staff now works for the town of Carbondale. Um, so we see it as an opportunity to get people in the door in um, the realm of outdoor mm -hmm. and land management professions. Uh, you can keep going. So this coming project season, these are all of our community projects, so open to the public, but we also work with local groups, like I mentioned. So we work on about 80 to 100 different project sites in our service area. Um, we hope to be working with Hanging Lake. We do not have a date right now because they are currently contracting with the new trail construction team and they just need to figure out the logistics there. Um, but the, the National Forest Foundation has told us that it's very important to get volunteers out on that project. So our hope is to make that happen. And then we'll be sending our trail crew to Grizzly Creek um, to help with the reconstruction of that trail as well. We'll be continuing our fire mitigation work at Wolfson Mountain Park. And then we have some fun projects that are a little outside of Glenwood Springs, but um, our Marvel Stewardship Extravaganza is a weekend of stewardship and family fun and camping. And it's a way to bring some resources to a newly found, um, you know, kind of gem of a place that doesn't have a lot of resources to manage the impact and in the increase in recreation that they've seen post pandemic. And then we have um, a lot of wilderness stewardship projects that we're working on in the Maroon Bells Snowmass Wilderness and Four Pass Loop. And this, finally, we are working at the Betty Bear Hut with the 10th Mountain Hut Division. And this is a new formed partnership to try to bring volunteers into that hut system. Um, so those are my updates. I'd love to answer any questions if you have any or just get you excited about maybe the snow melting and getting out and um, getting your hands dirty. I'll bring it back to council. Any questions? Great. Yeah. Oh, okay. Council Arnold. What makes Glenwood so special? What did we do to earn the partner of the year? I'm curious. Oh. Or is this just yeah. the Glenwood version? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to mention that. Sorry, I was on maternity leave this summer, and so I feel like I wasn't there fully. I mean, I wasn't, but... Um, Chad, who is the trails, um, I think he's the parks and trails supervisor, yeah. is one of the most amazing people to work with. And so he is so responsive, he's so kind, he's enthusiastic about the work that we do and um, wants to just continue growing this partnership. And so Chad is really the, the reason that you all won that award. Yeah, right? <laughs> Good to know, thank you. Yeah, so shout out to Chad, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well then we will just say thank you. I mean, this is, this is one of those organizations that does so much good for our community that we could not do. So the partnership is invaluable. And so we just really appreciate it. Thank you for staying in touch. Thank you for coming this evening. And we look forward to continuing work. Thank, Thank you. Have a good you too. Okay. We are moving on to a Southbridge update.
We are about there. Where is the share the presentation button? You know, the slideshow button, who knows that answer? Bottom right. Yeah. Bottom right? Very, very bottom right. It's a big screen to the right, to the right. You just need to act like I'm a third year. Oh, there's that one right there, right? Look at that. All right. Wow. One would think I'd understand how to use this system, but one of these days. Uh, hello, City Council, uh, Ryan Gordon, the City Engineer. So here for our Southbridge update, and I promised last time that there would be some meaningful updates, and in fact, there are some meaningful updates. <clears throat> so we met with CDOT and FHWA in Denver on February 22nd. Um, the purpose of that meeting was to review a few ideas that we came up with um, for possible optimization changes to the project. Um, before I go into the details here, I, I wanna make it very clear that this effort was to identify any of the elements that could possibly be altered, changed, optimized. It's not necessarily these will be adopted overall. Those will be decisions at the future. So uh, this was kind of, hey, we threw everything at the wall and saw what kind of stick sort of exercise. Um, the, the, the key elements that we're gonna be discussing today are um, the bridge type, um, the bridge and the road height as you leave the South Bridge um, and heading towards State Highway 82, uh, utility, sidewalk and pedestrian and biking connectivity, and then some roadway elements. Um, overall, none of the elements with regards to the RAFTA portion, so that's the Rio Grande Trail, nor any of the CDOT improvements. Um, approximately, we're, we're redoing approximately two miles of State Highway 82 um, were considered. Both of those um, per, per CDOT are basically done done deals, so to speak. So those were not to be considered and were not included in any of our, our discussion um, or for value engineering. So the big one that we, we presented to them is, is the bridge type. And just to refresh, this is what's from the existing design. So this is a concrete segmented bridge. Um, so it's showing both the cross section and the layout um, to give you an idea of what it was and the key things to look here. So the span between the two piers is 270 feet. The pier on the east side is <clears throat> um, located above the bank and outside of the mapped wetlands. Um, here's a cross section of that bridge. So again, this is the segmented concrete bridge, um, a fairly unique structure as we've gone through the value or the, the peer review and some other items um, requires some unique construction practices and in, in, in quite a bit of, of, of money to construct. Um, this is what we proposed to FHWA and CDOT. Um, so again, it, 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 it's good to look at the, the span too, as you can see on the top is about 210 feet. So down 60 feet from before in order to get to that span and then also to the bridge type we had to move in that east pier from off of the, let's say the top of the slope down into just outside the 100 year floodplain. Um, what that means is that we will be permanently impacting some amount of wetlands for that pier. Um, however, the pier location for the initial 90% was actually gonna drill through an underground spring that fed those wetlands. Um, really the, the argument that we made to FHWA was there is some amount of, of impact to those springs and it's very difficult to know what they are, but given that we would not be touching the springs by doing this methodology, um, the rationale was this is much less impactful. Um, here's a cross section of that bridge. Um, what you can see is there are, um, so this is really synonymous to what you see either the Grand Avenue Bridge or the 27th Street Bridge. So these are, this is called a steel girder bridge. And this is one that was recommended by SGM and Flatiron Construction during our peer review. And this is what we presented. Um, I'm gonna go, there, there's some other things, but, but, but one other thing to, to pay attention to is the width of this bridge. So we're looking at a, a 41 foot span or um, excuse me, width compared to 47 feet. Um, I have a few more talking points on this as we move forward, but that's just something to sort of um, pay attention to. Um, <laughs> 
So, you know, th that's that's really the, the summary of the bridge. Um, and and I, I guess I won't leave to the end sort of the cliffhanger and, and whether any of these were accepted. FHWA agreed with our analysis and our conclusions that this, in fact, was the, the steel girder bridge was, in fact, a less impactful project or bridge. And they were um, accepting that if we wanted to, we could move and, and change that bridge type. Um, money wise, as, as was presented during the peer analysis, um, a change of this bridge type based on 2024 numbers is approximately 10 to $12 million in savings in upwards of 12 to 16 months of um, reduced construction time frame. So the other aspect that we looked at was lowering the entire bridge. Um, so at, at crossing the Roaring Fork River and then also here on um, the east side. So what you see here is in, in, in north is to the top of the screen, at the top of the page, to the south is the Jackson Family Ranch and to the north is the Holy Cross um, property. This is from the 90% drawing set. Um, not really that fancy or, or, or whatnot, but you do see both access roads, the farm access road on the south and then the access road to Holy Cross to the north. Then obviously as you travel to the east, you come up a grade over the Rio Grande Trail to a, a intersection on State Highway 82. Um, so what we proposed is we wanted to drop this whole platform, the bridge and this road, um, approximately 12 feet. So a, a few things to pay attention here. These are cross sections of the various areas. So on, on the left is the cross section of, of the bridge and then as it approaches to State Highway 82. So State Highway 82 is on the far right-hand side. Let's see, is there a cursor? Oh, there is a cursor. So up here is, is basically the terminus. Um, the existing ground um, you, you can see is quite a bit lower than both the road and the bridge. So again, we're dropping this whole thing down, reducing an, an enormous amount of fill soil that we have to bring in. Um, on the right-hand side, and in, 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 in I've red boxed, um, 5%. So that is the current 90% grade from the bridge upwards to State Highway D2. If we kind of go to the right off of the uh, the Jackson Ranch, um, a, a modest slope, um, 1.56, really, you know, not, not very steep. But the point being is the existing ground is substantially lower. And so there's a, you know, quite a bit of fill that was required here to get the Jackson Ranch Road up to the Southbridge Road. And then in the bottom right-hand corner is the cross section of the Holy Cross access. Um, again, a bunch of fill, but, but what I want, want to point out is, is uh, a 10% slope coming off of the Southbridge Road into the Holy Cross area. They've expressed to us that that's a pretty steep slope for a lot of their, their, their equipment. And so, um, when we lowered the road, it, it, it did a lot of different things. So the thick red line is the extents of grading and impacts to the site based on the current 90%. Um, the thinner blue line is our revised lines of grading. You can see it's a substantially um, reduced footprint um, to give a scale um, on the right-hand side of that intersection between the red line and the blue line is approximately 25 feet. So if, if we're, we're looking at the ranch, um, that means 25 more feet that they can use um, for their pasture land. Um, and it, it may or may not um, you know, result in less right-of-way purchase, but it's certainly less impacts to their ranch. Um, the real big impact, oh, the real big impact as you can see on the screen are the various slopes. So um, Jackson Ranch doesn't really change 1.8 from 1.6. So in fact, actually we're increasing the slope but, if, but to give context, a, a sidewalk is sloped at 2%. So it's fairly flat. Mm -hmm. um, the big change is obviously to the north to Holy Cross. So we went from a 10% slope to a 1.1, mm -hmm. substantially better. Um, additionally, there are there were quite a few uh, retaining walls associated with uh, the 90%. So we were able to reduce quite a few of those. Um, there's still still going to be walls, um, particularly on the, the Holy Cross site as we approach um, the, the Rio Grande Trail. That's something that we really couldn't avoid. But again, we tried to, to figure out a way of really minimizing the impacts, make it more palatable, both the Jacksons and, and Holy Cross. Um, we've actually had subsequent conversations with the Jacksons. You know, one of their big concerns is they're bringing in either off of the ranch or into the ranch trailers full of full of cattle and farm equipment. So this makes it quite a bit easier for them to get on and off of their their property 
So the the big the the big change or or one of the changes is the approach road from this intersection up to State Highway 82. Um, you can see here we've increased that to seven percent. So to give some context to where seven percent is, seven percent is the same slope from the 27th Street Bridge up to Highway 82 at that intersection right where we're doing the underpass. So again, not massively steep. It's not you know this, as steep as you can get. It, it is steeper. Um, and, and a couple of our arguments to, to FHWA and, and why we think this is appropriate. One is our city street lot is just across the road, across the river. Um, in, in certainly in the wintertime, 7% or summertime, 7% makes no difference. So in the wintertime, this stretch of road would be one of the first ones that our plowing crews would be able to get to. Um, it's south facing, so it's going to get a lot of sun. So there's, a, there's, there's less problems um, um, from winter than, than maybe first, you know, first recognized here. A, a couple of things between lowering the bridge and reducing the width, um, you know, there's going to be less, less shading to the, um, the wetlands beneath, which could have some help with some of the, the plant growth there as well. So again, we found a lot of really good, um, good benefits to this. Um, and, and again, FHWA looked at this and, and, and agreed that this was an acceptable change within the framework of the current um, EA. So I'm going to continue to go through some of the other ones. These are, I, I'm not sure if I have any more pretty pictures for you guys. These are relatively <laughs> quickly. I can get back to other, other pictures, certainly. So um, utilities. So the project anticipated when it started, you know, quite a few utilities. The, the kind of the, 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 the conversation was in a perfect world, what do you want um, from the city? So we had big water lines, big everything for, um, you know, future development and whatnot. So the water system, we've reduced the, the size, the diameter of the pipe. We've done ex extensive water modeling over the years. We've determined that we don't need, I believe we had a, either a 16 or 8, 18 inch water line running through this whole site. We need an eight inch water line that can adequately serve um, any and all of the properties there right now and provide hydrants for fire flow and, and, and wildland fire um, fighting. There was a couple other elements. One was, and in a really big cost item, was a pipeline that went across the bridge, the proposed South Bridge, South, yeah, South Bridge, South Bridge Bridge, whatever you want to call it. Uh, <laughs> one of these days, we got to come up with some cool terms so we can differentiate these. We have, anyway, I, I won't go there. Anyway, um, again, we have water lines that come up um, through the Buffalo Valley area. And, and again, water modeling has demonstrated that while it's always good to loop your water lines. We're not losing anything by not not doing it. Plus, there's really not a development pressure on the east side of the river that would require or need water line. And 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 on and that point, and it actually you know you know cascades through a bunch of these. Our codes state that if you come in and build a project, you as a developer are required to provide a lot of the utilities. So if a project, and where I'm getting at is if if for some reason one of those properties down by the airport were to build, they would need to provide their infrastructure. So we're not losing functionality by taking away some of these elements. Again, we identified these as kind of the cherry on top, so to speak. Um, there, there were some appurtenances, um, blow-offs and air vacs that were, were relatively redundant and weren't necessary at the end of the day for the, the water system. Um, uh, the sewer system, we had a, a sewer pump station that was going to be located, a lift station at the uh, west side of the bridge. And again, that contemplated bringing wastewater from the east side over the bridge and then pumping that wastewater up into the sanitary system that's in, in the Park East neighborhood. Um, similar argument, we, we, we don't need that infrastructure now. Um, um, if a developer were to come in again, we would say, hey, look, you need to figure out how to get your wastewater from A to B type of thing. So we were able to, to eliminate that. Stormwater, um, there were lots of dry wells, uh, lots of underground piping. And it's not to say we are not interested or we don't care about stormwater because we absolutely do. But we've looked at, say, you know, in, instead of dry wells and, and, and big infrastructure, we're going to use kind of what's out there right now. You know, there's roadside ditches. There's, there's vegetated areas. And we'd utilize those same things, create some basins, um, you know, to treat the water. So it wasn't like we are sacrificing anything, but we're changing a, um, a little bit of, of, of sort of the, the philosophy out there for, um, for storm. Um, the electric system, we had quite a bit of, of lighting for the trail, sidewalk trails, roadways. 
we've looked at that. We think we can cut down the number of lights and sort of the styles. Um, the existing design kind of had more of an urban lighting plan. What we did is, is, is we're looking to eliminate approximately half of the lights. Um, again, still provide plenty of lights for that trail system and whatnot, but again, kind of more matching the, the, the kind of the rural character that's out there right now. We didn't think it was necessary to have, um, I think we had lights every 25 feet or something to that effect. And it seemed we could get away with, with, with something a little bit better, a little bit less. Uh, broadband, um, no change. We're still going to provide broad, broadband. In fact, in our grant application, one of the things we said is we would provide broadband not only to the airport, but across whatever bridge we contemplate. No changes there. Um, again, all of these ideas were um, um, acceptable to FHWA. So moving on to the sidewalk, pedestrian, and bike connectivity. Um, the 90% has sidewalks on both sides of the road, eight foot concrete sidewalks. What we proposed was to delete the eight foot sidewalk on the south side or the west side, depending on where you are in the orientation of the project. And in lieu of that, on the north side, we'll maintain that sidewalk, but we're gonna increase it from eight feet to 10 feet. Mm -hmm. So 10 feet's the standard trail size, of Rio Grande Trail, some other trails we're putting in. Um, you know, we thought that made a lot of sense and kind of back to the argument with utilities, if we needed sidewalk on the south side um, or the west side, we would have a contractor build that as part of their requirements. We're still planning on providing pedestrian crossing at key locations. So the historic Coke ovens is one, for example. Um, we have a grant with FMLD to do a parking lot and some handicap access ramps and whatnot. So we would provide an access from the Coke ovens across airport drive to this 10 foot path. Um, uh, as you go further to the north, um, at the Cardiff Mesa condos, again, we would pro provide those that connectivity from um, housing to the trail, and then maybe even down at, at County Road 163, which is kind of where the road bends and goes back down around to the bridge. Um, south of that's where Grand River Paving and a few other places are. So again, we would provide um, um, crossings where necessary um, with, with handicap ramps and, and, and whatnot. So again, we felt like we weren't sacrificing anything by um, eliminating that sidewalk on, on that south side. So some of the roadway elements. Um, so the project um, in, the, in the drawings basically start fairly close to the current roundabout at Four Mile and, and Midland. Over time, since this project has been in design, several aspects of airport's road have been improved. So the roadway itself, um, approximately 1,200 feet from that location south, has been fixed, repaired, um, primarily due to the Cardiff Mesa condos. Um, so one of the things is we presented is, hey, look, instead of redoing the road or adding to it, we would leave that there and start the project kind of where the, the, the um, road was improved to where the, the, the road to the south needs repair and whatnot. There's a few elements that would still need to be um, um, connected, so to speak. Uh, the sidewalk uh, ends at the Cardiff Glen neighborhood. So we would extend that certainly through uh, the, the, the south part of the Cardiff Glen and then connect to our proposed 10 foot sidewalk. Um, there are medians proposed, um, uh, several medians in, in the project. You know, we, we look to maybe eliminate those. Um, same thing, there was a, a roundabout at Morgan Street and Airport Road. Um, we had that on the list. Um, irrigation and landscaping. Uh, we had about a million dollars in the budget for um, irrigation and landscaping. So we pulled that off. Um, and so with the irrigation and landscaping, a couple of things that have kind of driven us that direction. One is the amount of, of, of maintenance that it would take to maintain now an additional, you know, half a mile of, of irrigation. So that would ultimately land on, on the parks and recreation group, um, generally short, short staffed anyway. Um, so we look to, to, to eliminate that. And then there will be some amount of landscaping and vegetation upkeep for, for weed management. And then of course, our stormwater is going into roadside ditches, which again, would have some amount of, of vegetation that would be needed. But again, not looking at trees or perennials or anything else. Um, also that sort of fits in with the current um, character of the area. There's not much out there right now. And again, it's not like we have a ton of development that would want or require a big landscaping 
landscaping need. Um, the, the other aspect, again, this is really driven by the, 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 the elimination of, of the sidewalk. So um, again, this is still contemplating that, that the tunnel under the, under the runway exists, but, but we're able to shrink everything up. So we're able to shrink that tunnel um, um, you know, which had eight foot sidewalks on both sides now to a 10 foot on one side. So sh shrunk it back up. And again, I showed you that cross section of the bridges. So instead of 47 feet width, now we're down to 46, 41 feet, excuse me. Um, some, some benefits there. And I, and I still want to, you know, you know, you know, really emphasize that, you know, while I do say eliminate, we are not necessarily eliminating anything from the project. These were, you know, presenting to FHWA, hey, if we pull these out, what what does it look like? And 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 we are really wanting to make sure that at the end of the day that we are providing a road that is not a bypass that is really an emergency access. So I can really see us adding back in a lot of these things. Um, you know, for example, the roundabout. The roundabout actually was not designed as a traffic roundabout, and we're going to have to do some redesign anyway. But I can really see a lot of these things. You know, wanting to be back in here to make sure that we are going to provide really good traffic calming measures. Um, which I, I guess I should have remembered what I put in these slides. The next slide is about traffic calming measures. You know, so again, the, the roundabout at Morgan Street and Airport Road um, um, is certainly one of those. And, and what we've contemplated as well is wherever we end up, if, if let's say for instance, that roundabout is not in there, um, we're gonna build the platform or plan for it in the future if we need to bring it back in or want to bring it back in. Um, so it's not something that we're going to suck in the sidewalks right next to the road. So we're going to make sure that we have the ability to have that roundabout in there. We've also discussed raised crosswalks at these critical intersections. Again, it is a measure to make sure when people get on Southbridge um, that they're not just absolutely flying down the road. Um, so curves and speed limits. So this will be signposted as 25 miles an hour. That's what we're planning on right now. Um, so I, I mentioned that this is looking at and still contemplating that tunnel. Um, one of the things that we have coming up in our next steps is looking at um, the possibility of, of getting rid of that tunnel and inducing and putting in a curve. Um, again, one of our arguments to FHW when it comes up is to say that curve helps with some traffic calming. Again, as you have to make a curve and a movement, um, it, it's, a, it's a lot better for, for speed control. Um, maybe add back in the medians, right, or looking at medians. We're looking at some other things too, speed cameras and some other ideas that we're, we're still contemplating. But, but I wanna just say that, you know, traffic calming and making sure that this is a predominantly an emergency access and not a bypass is really our goal and is really to protect the neighborhood. I know several of you guys live in the neighborhood, I do as well. I don't think the last thing we want is, is, is you know, millions of cars driving down the road at, at breakneck speeds. Um, so costs, I want to get on to costs now. So since, since today, we've all been talking, you know, with the grant, the $50 million grant, et cetera, et cetera, all in 2024 dollars. We really think this project, you know, our, our grant says we have to start construction no later than September of 26. So what we're starting to do is, is, is start to adjust these numbers um, for 2026 numbers. Mm -hmm. So in 2024, um, Flatiron Construction, at, you know, the beginning of this year, basically said it was a $92 million project, um, which does not include any other of the soft costs, so redesign, right-of-way costs, right-of-way acquisition. So talking to CDOT and some others, they're kind of seeing that that inflation is somewhere settled around 7% a year. Again, with these numbers, you could probably pick any number out there and be right or be wrong, but, but for this argument, we're making 7%. So that $92 million project is now one hundred and five. million. Um, we have some additional costs for right away, and I'll, I'll go into that. But looking at the, the 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 menu items that I presented has a potential reduction somewhere in the nineteen and a half to twenty three million dollar range um, in twenty twenty six dollars. So what that brings the potential cost of this project down to is an eighty eighty two million to eighty five and a half million dollar plus or minus some 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 fudge factor. Um, so we've done a lot of really great heavy lifting to kind of get to this point and predominantly with that bridge. Um, but we are needing some more, either more cuts or more money at the end of the day. Um, we still have some design to complete. Now, certainly if we redesign the bridge, we have more design than previous. Um, we've started to engage our consultant to have these conversations of trying to figure out 
what are those numbers to be? Um, somewhere in the million, million to million and a half to, to maybe even $2 million, we'll see where our consultant lands on those. And then right away costs um, will be someplace potentially in the seven to $9 million range. That's pretty conservative. In fact, one of the things that we've been able to do um, through this process is reduce or eliminate most of the right away costs in, um, in on the west side of, of, of the river. Really quickly, I want to ask this update. Is this price for the current plans or the revised plan? Good, good, good question, Thank Mayor. So the $105 million number is the current plan. Okay. Is Thank the you. segment Thank bridge and everything. That's for everyone. Just that this is if we were to stay the course with the current design Correct. and not use the proposed earlier in this presentation. Okay. Right. Thank you. Right. And okay. so yeah, that 82, 85 million dollars, what we see right mm -hmm. now with with the items that we identified. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I realized I, I missed over I, I I I went over one thing back in the um let's see where is it? I just wanted just to make a just wanted to make one one the, the last bullet item which I did not I I I, I glanced over. Um we're still gonna include a sidewalk that connects the park east neighborhood down to the bridge to make sure we have all of the connectivity. I, I apologize, I went over that a little quick and read all my slides. Um, so that's kind of where we are right now with 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 costs. Okay. So what are our next steps is in um, on March 20th, we're going back down to Denver to meet with FHWA and CDOT again to, to talk on three specific things. One is um, potential alignment modifications and optimizations to avoid that tunnel under the runway. Um, those would generally be to to shift the angle of the bridge to avoid the runway um, has a lot of, lot of benefits. Um, the second big thing is the sound wall. Right now we have um, approximately a thousand linear feet um, of between 10 to 14 foot high um, concrete sound wall in front of the Cardiff um, Glen neighborhood. We're going to revisit that. There's a couple of things. One is we already know we need to redo the sound study. Um, there's some criteria that we have crossed over um, with some of these changes. If we do adopt them, that would require a new sound study, which requires um, some new receptors to, to obviously take in what, what the noise level is. One of those calculations and one of the considerations is traffic volumes. Um, we've seen over and over with this project, the traffic volumes um, were estimated um, very, very conservatively. Um, in particular for the sound wall, looking at the impacts in, in, in the development up four mile, contemplated a major renovation of ski sunlight, um, massive development up there, plus an enormous amount of development up four mile. We think those numbers will come down. Um, and, and, and last, in and, and a couple of things, there, there was a, a, a vote by the homeowners in the um, Cardiff Glen neighborhood. We wanna go back out and, 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 and talk to them again and make sure that they understand it. We know a few of those homes have changed hands. So that would all be part of the new sound study. And again, we're not trying to convince people one way or the other, do you want one or not? Because at the end of the day, it is a federal requirement. Um, if it's deemed that a sound wall is necessary, it's really out of our hands, but we wanna make sure that everybody understands what that kind of looks like. And, 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 and just to give a real quick preview on the sound study, or the sound wall, excuse me, um, right now it's located in, in, in the center portion, about 15 feet from people's homes. Um, and it's it's kind of cutting across a big open space. And we'd also lose quite a few of some pretty old majestic cottonwood and trees out there. So again, we just want to make sure everybody understands what's going on. We'll have to ask those questions no matter what. We're not trying to you know put our thumb on the scale whatsoever. And the last thing that we're going to be talking with um, with CDOT and FHWA is is some of the details and talking about the grant. Um, what are the what that entail, and then then really iron out some of the right away processes. Um, we also have next week um, an, a, a second meeting with RAFTA to talk about the Rio Grande Trail and then also talk with transit and, and mobility options um, with RAFTA as we move forward. And I think, all right, I think that is that is kind of it right now for um, for my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions right now. Um, certainly, I'm, I'm anticipating that the next time I'm in front of you, we will have um, quite a few updates and hopefully... Um, some interesting ones. Sounds like out. Great. Okay. So, Brian, it sounds like just to verify every, all the changes that you're contemplating and talking about right now would 
you're you're working with FHWA and CDOT to make sure that they would stay within the bounds of the current EA. Right. Yeah. So yeah, in, in, in discussions, right. Yeah. We've, we're working with FHW to see what, what is, um, what can be accepted and we haven't <laughs> finalized okay. anything. Right. But as far as we know, what we've presented to them, they've been, they've been good with. Yeah. Okay. So once this is kind of more finalized, it will come back to council for further discussion of and approval. Right. Yeah. Okay. So at the, at the next, so, so you know, at the, at the March 20th meeting, um, we will leave that meeting with a very clear picture of what we can and cannot do from okay. the federal, from the FHWA perspective and from the grant perspective. Okay. Um, we will certainly come back and present to everybody what those options could be. And then we will need to work through what we want to include and, and not include. We have some things too that we want to add to the project potentially. Um, one is we've identified a spot that could be a great spot for a park and ride. Okay. Um, for the future, we've been contemplating um, public works and engineering about a raw water system for the South Glenwood area. So if we're digging all over the place, we would put in um, that raw water pipe system so we can connect any future tank pump station to Park East, to, you know, you know, Cardiff Glen, Glenwood Park, that kind of idea. Great. Or, or if we decided to do at least some landscaping or, or street trees along sure. airport route. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. So a couple of quick questions. Will the bridge, it, I saw on the slide that you're contemplated taking off the water line and possibly the sewer line, I think. But yeah, the, yeah, the sewer the line, bridge... just, just to clarify this, the sewer line was was a future potential. Okay. And, and, and the infrastructure was there on the west side of the bridge right. to accommodate a future um, sewer line, but there was no sewer line um, per the 90% um, design on the bridge okay. itself. Yeah. Okay. So will the will the new bridge, a steel bridge that's contemplated, still be structurally designed to handle a future water line or sewer line if those were to come? It on? would, yeah. So it would be able to do that. Okay. Right. Yeah. From, from from the high level, and we, we we you know we could install you know you know pipe hanger system and just leave that and kind just, of empty, or at a future time you know you know mount those. But certainly the bridge would be capable of supporting. Um, any of those infrastructure elements. Okay, and then one more question. As you're talking about kind of some traffic calming on Airport Road, are there any sections on Airport Road where you anticipate having street parking? No, no, no. We, we, you know, you know, we we, we wouldn't want. So, for example, um, there was some on-street parking, so to speak, some pull-off parking in front of the Coke ovens. Mm -hmm. What we've looked at already is be able to create some off-street parking. And that's predominantly because we don't want people backing out into into, into airport road. Right. And while we don't anticipate, we don't, we're not saying this is a bypass and don't want it to be. I, I think the reality is there will be people driving this in, in you know, fairly heavy amounts, perhaps during rush hour traffic that we don't want to have that, that interaction. So um, there was only a few spots that there was on street parking and it may just be the Coke ovens. Um, there may be an area a little bit further to the north, but, but we are not looking to have on street parking on, on this road. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Councillor Godis. Um, Ryan, thank you for the update. It's fantastic. All of this is really encouraging. Um, but we're asking questions, not comments. So uh, when you said FHWA, so far, ev everything that you've presented to F FHWA and CDOT, they've been like, yeah, that seems reasonable. Would you care to, I know you can't read their mind, but would you say that it would be a surprise if they came back in this March 20th meeting and said, yeah, you know, when we said that wetland stuff seemed reasonable, we went back and we're like, we just can't do that. Or, or was the tenor of the conversation like, yeah, this this feels pretty good. Like, like we can do this. Yeah. So we so we left the meeting with the understanding that the items we presented were acceptable. Okay. So I okay. would be shocked if we came back and they took a different tactic on the wetlands question specifically. Okay. Thank you. Um, Any other questions? No. Okay. Councillor Tim. Thank you. Uh, just real quick, the uh, eighty-two million dollars did that include the price for the tunnel under the runway? Yes, it does. Right. We, we still have the opportunity to save some money. So um, the other big items. So the tunnel is a big dollar number and the sound wall is a pretty big dollar number. What, what um, is the number for the tunnel? 
I think the tunnel is somewhere in that six million dollar range. If I had, if, if I, 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 that's where where it kind of lands, and the sound wall is somewhere in the two and a half to three million dollars. So maybe ten million in food. It it, okay. it could be. Thank you, Councillor Weimer. Ryan, thank you. Um, a couple of things I'd like you to just cover, I guess maybe for the record or whatever. But um, you're you're bringing the thing down by twelve feet. That's correct. Right. What does that leave for headroom? at high water. You so know? so yeah, so the, the the bridge piers are located out of the hundred year flood plain. No. The, oh, bo the oh, bottom yeah. of the bridge. Um 70 feet. Oh Jesus, really? Yeah. Um so unless there's some really tall rack. Yeah, okay. Very, very <laughs> very, very high. Okay. So yeah, you you you're gonna need Inspector Gadget go go boots to I, hit your head on the. I, bottom. I approve of seventy feet of clearance. <laughs> That's uh, such a good question. The set. Uh, so then, as you are value engineering, in my mind, there's kind of like two two things that we're paying attention to. One is is just the engineering standards, right? Safety and structure and all of those things. But then there's also code, right? So so Glenwood Springs code. Can you just kind of cover for everyone that? As we're talking about value engineering, we're also keeping an eye to code and we're not, you know, if if we're saying we don't need the landscape, it's that's it's the same sort of thing that we would tell anyone in that situation, you don't need a landscape. We're not creating special rules for ourselves here. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's that's an accurate statement. So um, you know, I, I don't believe we have specific code language in there for our streets for say landscaping provisions and whatnot. So certainly say the the width of the roads or the speed that we're designing the roads are um um you know meet what our codes ask for for those road designations. But we do have codes for things like sidewalks and access and lighting and right that's correct. Yeah. So th those all those items we are following the code. Okay. You know, so again for this the sidewalk, we're actually in you know, the 10-foot sidewalk is the standard for a trail. Mm -hmm. Um and then that's really what we're looking at, you know, a multi-use path. Um, and again, um, you know, one of the big things too is is stormwater, right? And so we are making sure that we are going to treat the stormwater um, to the acceptable levels. And we're going to have detention basins, and we're going to treat um, for pollutants um, and all that kind of stuff. So we're definitely holding ourselves to the same standard we would require anybody else. And then the, the last one is just: can you kind of give a statement that as we're looking to value engineer, we're we're not cutting into bone. Here, right that that I mean to value engineer this you could say it's going to be a, a gravel path you know for for a hundred dollars right but right. so you're not going all the way down so just talk a little bit about what what is that sort of minimum acceptable yeah. threshold that we're trying to value engineer toward so the the way we approach this exercise with FHWA both mm -hmm. this last meeting on the 22nd and, and and on the on the 20th of March um is actually quite frank not cutting to the bone but cutting down to the lowest acceptable level, so to speak. Uh, I, I think there's definitely elements that we would like to bring back into the project, but this ex exercise again was to find out where that bottom is of for the budget, right? And, and, and that it, bottom is defined by FHWA? Well, so it's gonna be defined by what monies we have to build the project with our funding sources, which is the, the, the very large grant we got we have um, several tranches of earmarks that have been provided by um, our federal partners um, and um, um, uh, RAFTA has provided some money. And then it's of course our match to that grant and whatever bonding capacity we have. As of right now, that's all the funding partners to, to, to speak of right now. Right. When we presented FHWA in, in the grant, um, we presented $76 million as the number that we could afford. And so with this 82 million or 85 million, wherever we want to be, we are still north of that by a little bit. And so that's kind of where we're targeting. And again, this was this was more of an exercise of, you know, where are we overall with mm -hmm. the project and where do we need to get to? Um, so, you know, we didn't cut things out that is going to, um, you know, you know, significantly harm the project. But again, we cut out things that, again, we don't necessarily want to cut out. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I'm going to specifically a lot of those traffic calming things we want to bring back in. And I guess, Ryan, super quick, a new, a new finally. Um, can you just talk a little bit about how are the decisions, how's this decision going to be made, right? So you guys are creating a big, long list of potential 
carve outs or, mm -hmm. or eliminations, right? Or changes. Um, what is that process once we get there to settle on, I want this, I want this, I don't want that, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. How does, what's that process look like? Um, yeah, we really haven't talked about that, but I really see um, you know, a collaborative process with with both you guys and, and then listening to the public as well and finding out what we want. Ultimately, it's going to come down to to dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. You know, removing or adding in things will cost some amount of dollars. And if we're comfortable with that, I think that's kind of the nexus. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's other ways to do it, but at least my initial thoughts is, you know, I'll put this where I'm trying to get it is it's not going to be me or the engineering group mm -hmm. making decisions in, 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 a, in a room with the lights out. It's going to be very much open and hopefully um, a collaborative process. Thank you. I just want to make sure that we, we all understand that the, the level that we brought this down to is not <laughs> bare bottom. It's code compliant. So this road meets our codes. It meets our slopes. It meets all of our widths. It meets everything. The sidewalks are supposed to be eight feet. We don't need them on both sides. We made the 10 foot on the north side. Then you have way better pedestrian facilities. You know, you can have bikes on both sides. You can stripe it. It matches with a 10 foot that already exists out by the school that we just built for South Midland. Mm -hmm. So when you kind of say bare bones, that's true, but that's what city streets are. They are bare bones. We don't want landscaping. It goes against our water saving techniques that we're trying to get out there. So put in urban drainage design, water quality swales, those kinds of fun things. I think we're refining it down to, we kind of had a Cadillac, we're going to end up with a Ford, you know? So, but the Ford is perfectly fine. I'm sorry if you own a Cadillac or a Ford, I just use them as random references. <clears throat> But that's what we need. We need to be able to get people from out, get people out of town on an emergency basis, do it safely on a daily drive also. Also incorporate the trucks that are going up and down to sunlight and into town, those kinds of fun things. So I don't want to think anybody think we're cutting this back to where it's just this tiny little road that barely functions. Mm -hmm. It's city standards that we're still building it to. The 7%, a couple of people have kind of scoffed at that a little bit, but they didn't realize 27th Street that functions the exact same way as this will is 7%. And this is adjacent to the streets department. So we can mm -hmm. hit it first thing in the morning and make sure that everything's good and it melts off by the end of the day. But I don't want anybody that's listening to this to think that we're literally cutting this back to just barely functioning. It is going to be a spectacular road at the end of the day, whether it's this option, which is just downscaling what exists and mm -hmm. plans, or we end up with a different option. Yeah. Different option actually helps with traffic calming a little more, adds those curves into it that slows people down. Mm -hmm. You know, So that's actually a great option. If FHWA does not say that's okay, then we won't. EA is a killer. We're not changing the EA. If we have to start that over, that is a non-starter conversation. And FHWA, so far, I think 13 out of the 16 items we presented to them, they're like, love it. <laughs> we kind of knew they were probably going to be like, no, you can't do that. Um, but I do want to say that that was the most productive and positive meeting I've ever had with a federal and state agency. Yeah, it's awesome. Ever. Yeah. They were they were positive. They were encouraging. They loved the ideas that were coming to them. They didn't even kick out options A and B, which were the other two. They said, let us think about it because it's risk. Mm -hmm. You know, it's associated. They have to write a scope of services attached to this agreement that's going yeah. to go back to the federal government and be signed at that level. If we change it too much, they may not sign it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the application yeah. has certain things built into it. In, the two sidewalks are built into the application, but they think if we get rid of the one but improve the other one, not a balances risk. it out. Mm -hmm. Change sure. the bridge type, they don't care. Yeah. And this is a bridge type that I know how to maintain. We own a bunch of them. It'd be mm -hmm. almost exactly the same as 27th Street Bridge. You know, so mm -hmm. they're easy to maintain. We already know how to do those kinds of things. So we're trying to bring it back to the scale that's usable for sure. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure everybody understands that that's listening to this. So, yeah. Right? And before you walk away, I have a quick question, Matt. And only because Matt was part of the original design. And and that is, I, I believe it came up at a work session, but when 27th Street Bridge was designed and rebuilt, um, at that time, it wasn't expanded to account for all that traffic flow anticipated because Southbridge, can you remind us kind of how that went down? So it was, a, the, yeah, 27th Street Bridge was looked at two different designs. One yeah. was a four lane bridge mm -hmm. and one was a two lane. Mm -hmm. The two lane bridge met traffic requirements for a certain duration. Mm -hmm. Once the city grows enough, the traffic increases enough. In actuality, the 27th Street Bridge will fail if South Bridge is not designed. Yeah. Well. Okay. Not structure. Not structure. No, no, no. No, no. 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 but like for traffic it's levels. To be a failure. Yeah. A yeah. Yeah. Which is why when they're building a 27th Street underpasses, mm -hmm. 
they're building that thing wide enough that there's two left turn lanes going on to 27th Street. Oh, okay. They're required enough Thank to do you. two left turn lanes on the South mm -hmm. Bridge. They have to merge together, but it does get a little more traffic sure. through. But yeah, is sure. Midland the bypass? For sure it is. Close it down for 15 minutes one time during mm -hmm. rush hour. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you tell yeah. me that's not a bypass for Grand Avenue. Yeah. We want to control what that bypass number means. Sure. Right? You know, yeah. people are always going to use it. They're going to get off on South Bridge and try to drive all the way through town. How, and I think Ryan put it painfully, can we make mm -hmm. that occur? Just like Blake Avenue, we want to slow them down and make it so they just want to continue. Through. Yeah. So really, you know, and, and that really was my point. And I wanted to just reiterate it on public record is that 27th Street Bridge would have had a much more dramatic impact to the neighborhood. And that, I mean, we would have had to take out condos in order to make it a four lane. Correct. And just think about the benefit of this. If right now there's three to three to thirty five hundred extra cars driving across Twenty mm -hmm. Seventh Street Bridge that just want to go up four miles. Yeah. They can just go to South yeah. Bridge. It takes a load off of sure. that traffic system for us. Okay. It pulls them off where that traffic jam is from Twenty Seventh mm -hmm. to McDonald's. It pulls them all off before they ever even get okay. there. Yeah. And it makes their the Grand Avenue system flow better. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um. And then my last questions before it looks like Councilor. Yes, Okay, um, and that is, you know, all of this, we, we are still very early in understanding if CDOT will support, if the county will support, if there's any other agencies, correct? We we have nothing on that at this point. When we figure out what the ask needs uh -huh. to be, we yeah. will ask. Perfect, just I to clarify. I to them saying, I need somewhere between 10 and yeah. $20 million. We want to go and say, I need seven from you and five from you. Yeah, right. That's perfect. what we want to be able to okay. do. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, Councilor Gotis. Yeah. yeah, sorry, some questions came up while everybody was asking their great questions. So how wide, uh, if we know, how wide is the sidewalk on South Midland right now? Six feet. Six feet. Okay. That's all right. Okay. Um, and how wide is the 27th Street pedestrian bridge? Shelly? <laughs> <laughs> I'll say it's 10 feet. I can look it up real quick. Steve, do you know? Steve? It's, it's basically 12 feet. The railings come in and compromise it a little bit. Okay. But functionally, it's between 10 and 11. Brian, okay. will you repeat that with that so that it yeah. gets the record? So the 27th Street pedestrian <laughs> bridge is somewhere between the 10 and 11 foot width. Thank you. Okay. Um, as, as a request, when we're seeing like savings and, and this in future uh, budget presentations, could you also include a slide that just always has the income as well. Just the 4 million from RAPTA, the 20 from us, the 50 million from rural surface. Just, mm -hmm. it, it gives, I think, a good picture of what we're shooting to mm -hmm. um, and where those sources are coming from. And more importantly, sometimes where those sources are not coming yeah. from. Yeah, and also where we're going, where yeah. who we need to still have conversations with. Um, and, and, and Councilman Godes, I, I can give you a quick verbal update on where that is. So with, with the total amounts that we have, um, with our 20% match. So that's not the full a &I bonding capacity. So um, with all of the, 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 the monies, we're at about 64 million. The, with a full a &I match, we're at 76. We're at 76. Okay. Correct. So is it fair to say if we're successful at that March 20th meeting of eliminating a 6 million tunnel and a $3 million um, potential sound wall, that we're there. There, there's close. We still have a large right of way acquisition number out there. So that right of way of seven and nine is is not included in the eighty two to eighty five. That's correct. Okay. And then any additional design costs is not included in that either. What is included in that number is um, construction management during the project. So we can provide, and I and I think we will as we get closer and understand what the project is. I think we'll start to break out. I shouldn't say we we will break out these items so we can very clearly see what all of the costs are, what are CM, what is right away, what is design, right? And so we can really give you a breakout. And so if you're easily able to go back to the budget was, and I can do it, for, oh yeah, you are, okay. So we're looking at potentially, maybe on the high end, $10 million of design fees and right of ways that are not included in the 82 to 85. That's right. Okay. Oh, thanks. That's just that just is, is helpful. Um, and, and I know we've talked about doing a more robust workshop exercise and kind of breaking out the cost and understanding what our bonding capacity is 
you know, what if we, you know, take X number of value the bonding, what's our ability in the future? So I think sure. we need to have that conversation as well. Sure. And I think Steve, you know, if we want to look at the, uh, that TIFA financing option as well, you know, that, that might be a finance conversation that I'd love to have with you, Nevada and whomever else. Um, this is just more of a curiosity thing, but what were the two or three items that uh, FHWA shot down that you're like, we'd love to take these out to reduce the scope. And they're like, now nah, we can't do that. Where were those things? Well, so on airport center drive. So this is the road that is on the East side of the airport per connecting park East. Um, what we presented to them is, is removing all of the improvements to that, including the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And they correctly came back and said, you know what, you know, mobility was one of the key things. Our, our, our argument was, look, it's a really low use road. People right now walk on that with not a problem. There's very little traffic. There's really not much except for airport traffic. The Forest Service has a yard out there. So our argument was like, look, people can just walk on the side of the road like they do now. And their argument was you need to provide some connectivity, some more safer walkability. And, and we should have known better. We should have said, yeah, you're right. That's what we should do. And, and so we added that back in. Um, there was a, a safety edge on the edge of the asphalt that they wanted to add back in. That was something. Um, and I think, I can't remember what the other thing was, but it was CDOT stuff. Yeah, we had, we had some stuff on the CDOT corridor that we looked at and, and they rejected those. So, and this is a legitimate question, not a, a comment, it's disguised as a question as it might appear, mm -hmm. but how... It, it, it seems like this will be a very similar, consistent um, continuation of what is exactly, not exactly, at the South Midland. So when you're driving South Midland, is it going to feel real similar except a 10-foot sidewalk instead of a 6-foot sidewalk? Is there? I mean, when you're just driving that, other than obviously cliffs and railings, is that going to be the same width, the same curb and gutter, the same asphalt, the same sidewalk-ish? So <laughs> as we pass through the roundabout um, the, and, and, and through the development, we're going to, we won't have any curb and gutter. Okay. So it's going to still be kind of how it is now mm -hmm. with some of those improvements, but the road width, um, I can't remember what's, what's South Midland road width right now. Are we oh, okay. South so, so, so the, yeah, the road platform will be the same. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those 11 foot lanes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, so a, a big, Thank you, because every single one of these slides that was so um, briefly presented to us was hours and hours of work, <laughs> and we recognize that, and we we really appreciate you and your entire team. So thank you. Thanks for the update. Absolutely. And we wish you all the best on the 20th. Is that what I heard? That's correct, yeah. Okay. So I think yeah. the next day we have a presentation to you, so we'll okay. see what yep. we can come up with Perfect. slides. Great oh, sorry. We wanted to, we, we actually had said we were going to do public comment. So we'll go ahead and, and before we close out this agenda item, we will have anyone here to speak about the South Bridge. Um, come on up three minutes of time. Thank you very much. I'm Steve Smith. I live in Roma Spring City Limit. Mm -hmm. Indeed, I live on the targeted airport road along this very corridor. Um, <laughs> We have been participating in this process for over a dozen years uh, from the first time it was seriously considered uh, because it comes through our, our home neighborhood. Uh, we've been very anxious about it. And in the last six years, we've been able to negotiate some specific design features that could mitigate the, the impact mm -hmm. on our home and our neighborhoods. All of those things we negotiated, if the 2B portion of your staff memo mm -hmm. uh, that is changing the length of the project uh, were included would be swept away. We would lose all of those mitigations that we so carefully negotiated with staff and the city council over those years. So we're very anxious and, in, and as close to insistent as we can politely be that those be retained. Um, we correspondingly really appreciate the qualifying language that's in the staff memo and again in Ryan's presentation that these are possibilities, mm -hmm. that these may or may not happen, that these are being considered. They have formal approval in case they want to be considered, uh, but we it prompted us to get down here and to send you a letter mm -hmm. that has more yeah. details of our thoughts uh, early in this consideration of what is and isn't a possibility. Mm -hmm. So we really encourage you to retain the traffic calming measures in particular yep. uh, between the, the current roundabout 
and this the south end of the Cardiff Glen neighborhood. Uh, those are just very important to keeping that portion of the road uh, human scale. Thank you. And and to confirm, I received a letter from these guys and I forwarded it on. Okay, okay, thank you. Heather, did you want to come up? Thank you. Um, I'm Heather McGregor, and I also live in Glenwood Springs on Airport Road. Uh, we've actually been um, faced with this project for about 20 years and uh, <laughs> wondering whether it would happen or not. I think now we've uh, recognized that it will. Um, and so I wanted to talk to you about two things, the noise wall and the landscaping. Um, I would really encourage Ryan and Matt and anyone else who represents Glenwood Springs at the next meeting to um, bargain hard on this noise wall issue. These noise walls are going to be um, intrusive. They're going to be divisive in our neighborhood. They're going to reflect sound back to us and uh, they're going to cut off a wonderful playground and uh, treed area that uh, is a a wonderful frontage for Cardiff Glen. Uh, they, the traffic projections that those noise projections result from are based on a faulty assumption that the 2008 proposal for Sunlight Mountain Resort, which included a tripling of day use skiers, a tripling of staff, and uh, I think something like 820 hotel, condo, and single family housing units would be developed up there. None of that has happened. That is an offsite impact that is you know, deep in the past and would have to be addressed if it were ever to come to the future. The traffic projections and then thus the noise projections assume that all that is built and that you've got President's Day weekend mm -hmm. and people are pouring in and out and uh, so it's it's completely overblown. And how this got into the 2013 EA in the first place, I don't know. And then it carried forward into the FONSI in 2020. And that's when I kind of got wise to it. And um, it just seems that reality should be uh, considered when uh, the uh, federal officials look at the necessity or really no need for that noise wall. Then onto the landscaping. I totally agree that non-native landscaping is not appropriate on this corridor. However, landscaping of native species, uh, native grasses, sagebrush, uh, rabbit brush, that type of thing that, we've, that we see out there now is essential. We've seen a lot of weed growth uh, at the South Midland, the new South Midland roundabout on the perimeters of that. Um, and it is ugly and it spreads into our yards and, uh, you know, around the retention pond and so forth. It's, um, you know, it's really ugly and it bothers me every time I see it, which is every day. <laughs> and I that. really would hope that you would do your best to prevent that kind of weed growth from happening along this new corridor. Thank you. We Thank appreciate you. your comments. Thank you both for coming this evening. Is there anyone else that would like to comment on the South Midland or the South Bridge project? Okay, great. Um, we will go ahead, unless Ryan had any additional comments to that, I think we'll, we'll wrap up that item. Oh, Jonathan had one more. Just one. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Mm -hmm. In the future also, can you, uh, Ryan, because you said March 20th, we're going to have some decisions. After that, you don't tell me right now, because I know I'm on the clock. Um, totally on the clock. After, after March 20th, can you, when you come back and present, show kind of what the different timelines and uh, future decision points are working back from when this goes out to bid or when we have the bid packet go and just kind of work back just so we know what we can expect in June, July, that would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yep, we can provide that. Thank you. Perfect. Yep. Okay, awesome. Um, we are going to move on now to our item that was pulled from the consent agenda, 
which would be item J, agreement for polling services related to the street and infrastructure tax. I'll let um, Steve Boyd kick it off. Sure, thank you. So um, we have a, an infrastructure and street tax that's expiring in 2026. We're getting ready to get that renewed. There are questions about should we try to renew it at its existing level or increase it by a quarter or half a point for council to make a good decision about that. We think there needs to be some polling done so that you guys have an idea of what's likely to pass and what's likely not to pass. And it's a little bit of a complicated issue. Um, so this item is a draft of a contract with Frederick Poles and uh, the city of Glenwood Springs for $18,500 to do that poll. Um, I'll bring it back to council for questions. Are there questions? Go ahead. Um, no, not a question specifically. Okay. Do you want to do um, Councilor Cap, do you have a question? I do have a question. Okay. Um, and I'm sorry, I was looking for something as you were speaking, Steve, so I apologize if you said this, but who will be like helping to formulate those questions and direct them? Will it be city staff or will it be community on the move if they're working on this or chamber? We'll say. Well, my understanding is it's probably a little bit of a collaborative effort. Um, it was the chamber that negotiated directly with uh, Frederick Poles to come up right. with the scope that you're looking at here. Okay, awesome. So the city is just paying for it. Mm -hmm. Right. For the benefit of the vote. Yep. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, if there are no further questions, I'll go ahead and bring it back to council for either a, a motion or some kind. Um Oh, go ahead. I would move that we approve the um, contract that was item J of the consent agenda, and we're now discussing now, but for the agreement for polling services with um, Frederick Poles. Seconded. We have a, a motion and a second. I'll bring it back to council for, for comments. Councilor Gubbis. Yeah, I think, you know, we, we've always, I think we've done this four or five times in the past, at least when I've been on council and every time we've done a poll, whether it be with Fredericks or Magellan or somebody else that we've contracted with, usually the poster comes before council and usually it's always been in a work session, right, Shelley, where they come and say, here's what we're proposing, here's the questions. And and typically what happens is, you know, we say, oh, can we ask about this? Can we ask about this? And the pollster says, mm, no, because we want to keep it concise and, and manageable and we want to keep that response rate up. But, but usually there's some comments from council of, well, maybe we should ask it this way. Maybe we should ask it that way. And so I think, you know, the, the, the only thing, um, if we could, because the um, specific item in here that from the staff report is that um, it looks like the, the chamber is going to develop the questions. And I just, you know, maybe offer a friendly amendment to Shelley to say that, you know, this actually codify the collaborative approach where the chamber or whoever representatives from the chamber, city council, staff, and Fredericks come to our next work session and just sit down with us and say, here's what we're looking at. Here's like they always have done. Um, I think if we're putting the bill forward and paying 18,500 that we should at least be able to see the, um, and, and have some kind of understanding of what's going out to the public that we're paying those money on. So. Shelley, would you be open to having that as a friendly amendment? I'm afraid I am not at this time. Just because, and and I have my light lit up to make some comments also, but I do feel like this is a really important tax question that we will be hoping to bring to the voters. And I think it's important that we have a, a somewhat objective community organization that's more grassroots that brings these questions and works on the polling questions to the public you know and and i'm thinking back to the last time that the ai vote was passed and the ai was tax was renewed and there were some very important questions on there there were important projects that were put forward to the public, one of them being Southbridge, but other other projects. And um, council was not involved at all that I know of in that polling. In fact, I didn't even hear about that poll until it came back from that community organization. So I think that objectivity is important, but I believe they will work closely with staff 
to have to make sure the information being put forth is correct and accurate. So I would rather have staff work directly with the group just to make sure that things are accurate, what's being put forward is accurate, but I'd rather not have us as elected officials involved in that polling, if that makes sense. That's just that makes sense. my preference. I'm gonna jump in now too, and instead of doing the, com or I'll probably add a closing comment, but I'll just add that that my experience on council has, has watched a few different tax questions come and go. Um, but one in particular was the 2C efforts, um, and that was to support uh, affordable housing. And on that one, that was another one where council stayed out of it, recognizing that there were some there were some community groups that that said, "We've got this. We we have our we've defined our our goals, and we'll let you know when and if we need your support." And they never asked for our support. Um, instead, they were able to pursue it and, and get an, an unbiased. I, I think that in this moment in time, council doesn't need to to be too involved. So I will support the the motion as it's as it stands. Councillor Gotis. Oh, sorry, this is a okay. Pistol. Okay. Any other comments? If not, I'll call the question. Missing one. Oh, missing wait. one. It's me. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I hit it. Okay. Okay. That was funny. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Mayor Wusa, yes. Councillor Godis, no. Mayor Pro Tem Dame, yes. Councillor Weimer, yes. Councillor Kapp, yes. It passes 4 1. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate, I just, I do appreciate the alternative perspective. And I will, I will say that. You know, to, to Shelley's point, um, this is a really important tax measure in question, and those who are willing to help and support us with it, I really, I really appreciate it. So, thank you. Okay, um, we will bring it back to council for council comments. Councilor Cal. Okay, I have to get back to my notes where. <laughs> Um, I wanted to speak just to thank a couple of our um, board members that will be stepping off of their boards in this month of March. This They've already probably had their last meetings. And one of them, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Stephanie Davis, who is on the Arts and Culture Board. Mm -hmm. She has been on that board. Um, since 2017, 2018, when we actually formed the new Arts and Culture Board. She's done a fantastic job of working through the board's kind of duties and working through the public art plan that was put together. She brought a lot of expertise to that and great leadership to the board. She's been chair of the board for the past, oh gosh, several years. So thank you so much to Stephanie for really stepping up and giving strong leadership to the community and for arts and culture. Yeah, we really appreciate good. it. She's been invaluable mm -hmm. and we will miss her on the board. I'll so, miss her sense of humor, just the name. Yes, yes. <laughs> sense of humor is awesome. Yes. And she has the cutest dog. So if you see her now, I'm walking. Um, but also then from Transportation Commission, John Stevens is yes. stepping off of the board. He's been a longtime member, also probably about the same 10 years since 2018 a very strong advocate for bicycle safety, bicycle infrastructure and trails, and um, all alternative modes of transportation. So we will miss his voice on the board. He's shown great leadership in working on issues in different areas of the city to work on bicycle and pedestrian safety. And um, once again, thank you to any community member that just steps up and serves the community in this way and you can have such influence on this city by volunteering for a board and letting your voice be heard and working with the other members of the board so i i really just wanted to say thank you to them and thank you to all of our board members thank you councillor Gotis. 
Um, Senate Bill 100. Senate Bill 100 is the bill that is uh, the Glenwood Canyon. Actually, it, it's more than just Glenwood Canyon, but it's Glenwood Canyon essentially to um, uh, Evergreen, Golden essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the traction laws. These are updated of the traction laws, uh, increased fines. It is uh, trucks mandated being ha or having to travel in the right-hand lane. Um, they took testimony at a committee hearing yesterday, and it did pass out of the committee with bipartisan support. So it looks like Senate Bill 100 is um, being viewed favorably anyway. Um, let's see. I attended a cast meeting for a little bit today. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of the housing stuff that last year, which was Senate Bill 213, which was very prescriptive and was very um, local control, um, took a lot of local control away. Uh, a lot of that is, some of that is still being contemplated. It's only being contemplated in the metropolitan planning organizations, which are your large cities. So it doesn't, none of it impacts us. There are some great opportunities though, specifically with ADUs, which we've done about 90% that we can opt into and qualify for state funds, um, including loan funds. Um, which would be great for people because those ADUs are really expensive to put mm -hmm. in. Um, and then last, I just wanted to say, because I didn't um, get a chance with the last vote, you know, when I've been asked to kind of explain my no vote a little bit. And uh, to that point, you know, I think if, if public dollars are going out and we're spending public dollars and we're going to be the body that also is going to be asked to put it on the ballot, we definitely have a role in this. As much as we want to push it out, if, if, they're going to, if some group is going to come to us and ask this council and they're not going to go to the citizen petition route, then I think we have a duty to the taxpayers to at least review the questions, to see the questions and offer suggestions because that's tax dollars that are being spent that we are allocating. And we're going to also refer to the ballot. So that's, that's why I thought that we should at least be able to preview um, the things. And that was my note. So I wanted to explain that a little bit more. Thank you. Um, I have just two comments this evening. One is something I'll, I'll reiterate that I said earlier this evening, and that is that this council does want to hear what people have to say. Um, there's a lot of opportunities. In the last few weeks, a lot of people have reached out to me about a myriad of different issues. Um, city council at cogs.us, great way to start a conversation. And then after that, set up time for coffee, set up time for a phone call. Um, there's so many opportunities. But in this day and age, I will I will reiterate also that social media is not a conduit to your elected officials. It is maybe to your neighbors and your friends that are on social media with you. But if you truly want your elected officials to hear your concerns, you have to get you have to use a different means. So I invite you to use them. Um, I invite you to come to our meetings. We have plenty of seats. I can see them in front of us. Um, many are empty at the moment. But please come. We want to hear your perspectives on so many of the decisions we make. And if we don't, then we only hear one side of the story and one side of the issue. So, um, And then the second is just a shout out to Councillor Weimer in that earlier this evening he asked a question saying we're not on, on Southbridge, that we're not creating double standards. Like the community would have to do this, but when it's a city project, do we go by a different standard? And, and thank you to to Ryan Gordon, our, our engineer, to say, no, this is this is code, but that's so important to me. So I really, really appreciate that level of integrity. Thank you. Anyone else? Right, okay, thank you. Um, I'll move on to our city manager. Okay. Thank you. Uh, three quick things. Uh, we are out for a fire chief. Gary is retiring, as you guys know. We had 33 applications to close last week. Um, we eliminated 14 of those as being not qualified for the minimum. Um, that leaves 19 left. We're working with leadership in the fire department to narrow that down to about 10. The plan is to do about 10 online interviews, record those, you know, distribute the recordings, get input from people and bring in somewhere around the three to five. And then we'll have them come in, meet with everybody. You guys will have a chance to talk to them. We'll have a public event of some kind and, and we'll hope to make a job offer sometime in May. What are reality shows to do a Should we? Yeah. Only if it involves fire. <laughs> Each week we um, put somebody off. Yeah. And putting fires out. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Please. Um, 
as part of that, I know Gary was very strongly and intimately involved in putting together our fire evacuation plan and, you know, working with all the different agencies and everything. And I guess I was kind of hoping that we were going to have a rollout of that in for public information, PR type stuff, so the community's aware, like as much as they can be aware of and what the roles are and, um, you know, kind of a basic outline of what the plan is, where they go. I've had some neighbors tell me their plan is if there's a large fire on our side of town, they're grabbing their stuff and heading for the river. So <laughs> we need a better plan than that. And I know it's there. Um, um, so I, I guess, is that something that we can take care of before we lose Gary? Or is that something that will be part of the new fire chief's role? Or no, I think that's a good idea. We knew Gary was leaving as we put this together. So we, we had that kind of in the windshield. Um, we're just about finished with it. Um, yeah. So let me check the schedule, but he doesn't leave until the first week of April. So we could probably do that. Okay. Yeah, I was or at least not knowing, time. you know, if we would have maybe some public meetings in different parts of town. Maybe that's part of the new um, community outreach contractor that we're talking to, but just put that out there. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, second thing, we had a fire in our parks building on Soccer Field Road Friday night. Um, our fire department put it out. They did a fantastic job by getting it out quickly without, you know, drenching the place in water. Um, we are going to relocate the staff that was in that building. There are 13 of them to the mall mm -hmm. in a little space that we've just rented from Frank Woods out there. I think it'll be perfect for them. Uh, we've got some equipment and some tools and stuff that we need to get uh, stored somewhere. So we're working with public works to see where we've got a little bit of room for that. Um, the vehicles, uh, the ones that run every day will probably go to the mall where the staff is probably out back. And then the ones that we only use occasionally will stay where they are. So we've got uh, blue sky doing the restoration, our adjusters, McMillan, uh, we've got electrical and structural engineers, and we've got fire inspectors that are all on with SIRSA. So that's the plan there. We'll know you know, more probably in the next couple of weeks, but I'll try to give a quick update as we go along as to where we are in that. But I think we're in okay shape now. We shouldn't miss too much of a beat. Great. Last thing is um, save the date, CML conference mm -hmm. in Loveland, Colorado, June 18th to 21st. So if you would like to go to that, uh, be in touch with Sarah. She can get you registered and all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. Perfect. that's it Thank for you. me. Thank you. And I don't, I don't think that we um, had an opportunity to say how great Frank Woods was. Just how responsive he was to the request and just a really good neighbor. Yeah, I, thanks for pointing that out. Mm -hmm. um, he took my call on Saturday morning and he said, whatever you guys need. So yeah. he was really very, very pro city. And, That's and awesome. we do owe him a big thanks for that. And thank you, Steve. That was a Saturday morning for you as well. So thank you. Yeah, we appreciate you. Um, city attorney. Um, sure, I was going to do a quick mid-continent mine update. Um, as you all know, the um, determination of common variety finally came out about a month ago after five years mm -hmm. of waiting for it. Um, it came out mostly favorable to the city's position that um, the limestone at the mid-continent mine is uh, not locatable because it's being sold for um, just common uses such as construction and riprap. Um, there, there is a, a small caveat in that um, where BLM said that um, the high quality limestone that is sold for FAA regulated runways is a locatable use. We're still trying to figure out what that means. Um, and then also just generally what the decision means for the mine moving forward. Um, you know, this has been a pretty opaque process. Um, we uh, kind of have been relying on BLM personnel to keep us abreast. Um, and we learned last week that Larry Sandoval with the Colorado River Valley Field Office will be leaving soon in the next few weeks uh, to move to Casper, Wyoming. He's been kind of our main conduit at the local level. So um, we're planning to uh, probably re-engage here uh, shortly with BLM uh, at the field office, uh, regional office and state office levels to ensure that we keep that um, line of communication open so that we're kept um, kept up to date on any any decisions, um, mm -hmm. any appeals that might happen. Um, RMI probably has some appeal right here. 
Um, so should they appeal, you know, the city, I, I think as an interested party as a cooperating agency and existing processes would want to, um, to be informed of that. So, mm -hmm. um, that's kind of our plan is probably get, get a letter out here, uh, to BLM pretty soon, uh, from the city kind of expressing that and, um, looking to maybe get some meetings with folks to get a better sense of, of where this is heading. Okay. Any questions? Hey, thanks for your continued efforts on that. Do you have any questions? Any? Oh, Jonathan, Councilor Gertis. I don't have any questions of that. I do have oh. questions of Steve's update. Okay, let's just double check you before we go back. Um, anybody questions about mine? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Um, Steve, is there any possibility, or can we have a conversation if it's uh, available? Um, you know, we we not that a fire is an opportunity, but I, I do regret. Um, that we weren't able, or that we we didn't put any housing above when we built the electric building a couple of years ago, a couple of years ago, maybe a year ago. Mm -hmm. We have an opportunity now with, is, is the soccer field road building a total loss? We don't know yet. Okay. We're looking into that. And the idea of, uh, you know, if we rebuild it and as we rebuild mm -hmm. it, we might be able to get some workforce housing in there has come up. It's already come up. Uh, but there are a lot of questions that still have to be answered on that. But yeah. Th that would be great. I think that'd be a great use of possibly 2C money to be able to just use that infrastructure. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great minds think alike there, huh? Um, okay, excellent. I will bring it back to council for a motion to, oh, announce the social where, event please where do you guys want to go oops hold on we have a correspondence oh, there's a, there's yeah there is something in correspondence uh hold uh, on let's all related to pay as you throw okay i didn't see that um hold on one second let's do this i'm going to take just a moment to look in correspondence I don't see that. Hold on. Oh, hold on. I know. Did you all see it? So yeah, basically, there's... somebody asking us to put um, uh, this let's this letter into the packet and then oh. have it addressed in a regular meeting. So you guys can look and see what you'd like to do about that. Um, can you do this for instance? It, it appears that quite a few city councilors missed it. Can you just put it again in the next meeting so that we and we'll be sure to to look at it and and acknowledge it. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, OK, so I'll bring it back to council for a motion. Oh, what are you doing? Hi, can I say Hi. something real quick? Yeah, sure. Um, the letter that was supposed to be in there was from a gentleman that I actually spoke to tonight. Andy. No. Oh, different one. Whole entire another human being. Okay. Um, I think we've kind of come to a resolution. So that's what maybe we hold off on. I want to talk to Steve about that. Yeah. So I think we've probably handle that situation. Okay, perfect. So moving it potentially forward or eliminating it altogether is on the table. If I can't eliminate it, we'll move it forward to the next meeting, but okay. I think we could probably eliminate that. Excellent. Well. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Thanks for all your efforts on that. Um, motion to adjourn. Anyone? No. Oh, we're still yeah. we're still on where we're going to go. No. Um, so we will reconvene at Doc Holidays in about 15 minutes. Okay. Um, hey, how about a motion to adjourn? <laughs> We go. I move to adjourn. Second. Can I get your mic, please? Okay. Second adjournment. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you all for who came here this evening. We appreciate your efforts. Um, have a great night.